Viona Popi, the place of the Pope, is the central mission headquarters of the Vicariate Apostolic of Rabaul. It embraces the large islands of New Britain, New Ireland, New Hanover and Marlis, and includes many smaller islands in the Bismarck Sea, north and east of New Guinea. It's mostly rugged mountainous country, covered with a thick growth of tropical vegetation. Situated just south of the equator, the climate is hot and steamy, the soil fertile, the rainfall more than 125 inches a year, the native population more than 150,000. In 1882, the missionaries of the Sacred Heart under Father Navarre, later Bishop of Papua, landed on Matavit Island in Blanche Bay, which was known to be the center of densest population. Here, in the shallow volcanoes, the first mission was begun under tremendous difficulties. But in spite of early reverses, slow progress was made. From their first little station on Matavit, now marked by a crucifix in the native style, they extended their influence along the sea coast up into the Binding Mountains, then across the sea. From Cape to New Britain to Kebiang in New Hanover, from New Hanover across to Manus in the Admiralty Group, their labours bore such enduring fruit that in 1941, after nine years, the missionaries could number more than 62,000 converts. From their centuries-old pagan beliefs, from the fear of devils, from the influence of magic, from cannibalism, from tribal warfare, the people were won over. But not without three brothers and five sisters were murdered in the Binding Mountains. But as happened elsewhere, the blood of the martyrs certainly was the seed of Christians. And soon the churches were crowded on Sundays and Holy Days for the celebration of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. Being naturally musical, the people delighted in singing hymns and chants in their own native languages and in Latin. Special singing would always be a feature of a visit of their bishop. who came to Vunapopia from distant parts were very happy to visit their bishop, especially those who knew him when he was Father Sharmak, their own missionary working in their district. The conversion of the people was accomplished with as little disturbance as possible to their traditional way of life and customs for the missionaries wanted to Christianize the people, not to westernize them. Customs and traditions compatible with a Christian way of life were encouraged. Each tribe retained its ancient forms of music and dancing, expressive of the cultural background and age-old traditions. To the average European observer, the music is noisy and the dancing meaningless. But the missionary, with his intimate knowledge of native life, realizes that it is their interpretation of the beauties of nature that finds its expression in rhythmical drum beats and measured movements of the body. Artistic headdresses and body colorings in these dancers have been accurately copied from various species of birds of paradise.
But in 1942, the dancing drums of peace were stilled. Cry havoc and let loose the dogs of war, said Nippon. And war swept over the Pacific. In January 1942, Rabaul was captured by the Japanese. They took possession of Unipopia, converted the buildings and equipment to their own uses, and forced the natives into labor battalions. missionaries were imprisoned and lived for three and a half years in caves in the Romali Valley. During their imprisonment, 61 missionaries died, some from disease because medicines were lacking, some from slow starvation. Others were killed by bombs from Allied planes bombing Japanese installations. New graves were added to the cemetery at Bunapopia, where already many valiant missionaries including the first Bishop of Rabaul, Archbishop Coupe, rested under the crucifix, now damaged by war. When the missionaries who survived were released late in September 1945, they returned to their post to find complete destruction and devastation. Not one building, church, school, mission house, convent, hospital or workshop remain standing. Only the concrete foundations, pitted by bomb fragments and cannon shells. Everything was destroyed. Everything except the strong faith of the people and the indomitable courage of the missionaries. Weakened though they were by their terrible ordeal, they began at once to rebuild, using such scrap material as could be found on the spot to erect materials and buildings for mass and for school. The native Catholics flocked to their assistance and built temporary structures of bush materials, rough poles and logs for the frame, and thick grass thatch for the roof, with a gable of old galvanized iron to give added protection against the heavy tropical rain. Platted screens were made for the walls, and special decorative designs were woven for the mats that would cover the sanctuary floor. With very few exceptions, the natives had remained staunch to their faith, in spite of severe pressure put on them by the Japanese. Later, steel frame buildings were purchased from disposal sales of surplus army equipment and concrete mixers were set to work as the missionaries began to rebuild on a permanent basis determined that their mission stations would rise from the ashes more durable and better planned than before. The brother's house is now completely restored, while the cathedral, though still unfinished, is much larger and more suited to the climate than the old one. Yes, the cross has been raised again on Bunapupi Hill. It looks down on powerhouse and printing shop, cathedral and hospital, convent and dispensary, store and workshop, an enduring memorial in concrete and steel to the indomitable courage of the missionaries. Close to the seashore and wharf are the carpenter shop, supply store, engineering plant, boat repair shop and motor garage. Electric power for the machinery comes from the powerful generating plant, recently purchased from Germany which has been specially designed to operate on low-grade fuel. In this case, coconut husks, never in short supply in this country, where the principal export is copper made from the dried kernel of the coconut. Electricity is supplied not only to the workshops, 
but also to the schools, convents, hospital, dispensary, X-ray plant, and the rest of this complex mission, which is almost a town in itself. The mission now has a fleet of 20 boats to replace those destroyed during the war. They serve as supply vessels to outlying mission stations and as convenient carriers of timber from the mission sawmills to the Vunapopi workshops. Local hardwood has been proved eminently suitable for building construction, provided that it's properly milled and treated. At the carpentry shop, native and coloured workmen use power saws to cut the timber to specify sizes and lengths. Their skill and assurance is a tribute to the experienced lay brothers who have trained them. All building work is done by the prefabrication method, under the direction of a lay brother who is a fully qualified architect. Plans of the new building are carefully prepared and materials cut to exact specifications and assembled ready for dispatch by ship to the mission for which they're intended. On arrival, they're quickly erected on prepared concrete foundations by a staff of builders, especially trained to construct them. The mission priest, therefore, is not required to spend his time in building construction, a task for which he is very rarely fitted. So he's free to devote all his time to mission work. Eventually, all the temporary bush shacks built hurriedly after the war will be replaced by solid permanent structures of the type that we're going to show you now. Would that the missionaries, priests, brothers and sisters whose lives were lost during the war could be replaced in such easy fashion. Not only is the external framework and shell of the building planned and made at Bonapopi workshops, but also the interior fittings, furniture, desks, seats, even altars for the new churches. Specially selected native timbers are used. The craftsmanship is good and the results excellent. A tribute to the brothers whose patience and skill in training the natives are now being amply rewarded. They have good reason to be proud of their work, of which this church on Mataput Island is a good example. A truly fitting house of the Lord, where he may dwell among his faithful people. Next to the carpentry shop is the central storehouse carrying large stocks of all the varied requirements of the missionaries. Clothing, footwear, household utensils, prepared food, trade goods of various kinds such as tobacco, bush knives and dress materials. Goods are packed to order and dispatched by boat to supply each mission station. The machine shop is a hive of activity. For not only is all maintenance work on the mission's complex machinery done here, but the brothers find time to initiate young coloured boys into the mysteries of modern engineering. No job is too large. Big marine diesels as well as jeep motors are efficiently rebuilt. They're then fitted again for service. As elsewhere, of course, the equipment is modern and expertly handled. The training is thorough and the young graduates are keenly sought after outside the mission. Ingenuity and inventive skill are frequently required to fabricate parts for a placement in urgently needed machinery. But very rarely indeed is any machine long out of service through breakdown. Boat navigation is a very tricky business in the seas surrounding the islands. For storms are frequent and numerous coral reefs have to be watched for. Occasionally boats go aground in the shallow waters and they have to come to Vunapope boat sheds for repairs to their houses. But whether repairs of a minor or major nature are required, the brothers and their helpers are equal to the task and the boat is soon fitted for service once again.
From its earliest beginnings, the mission has tried to be as self-supporting as possible. Land was cleared and planted with coconuts, which now show a handsome profit yearly. A profit which benefits the native population in education and medical service. Water buffaloes, which are hardy and resistant to disease and flourish in a tropical climate, graze among the coconut trees, keeping down the undergrowth and getting fat in the process. Some buffaloes have been trained to pull carts constructed from old Japanese ammunition wagons. A good deal of time and patience is required in their training, but time and patience are not in short supply here. The native drivers have become quite expert in handling their unusual beasts of burden. Coconuts fall from the trees when ripe and they're collected and brought by a buffalo cart to a working place where the nuts are split, the white flesh is removed with a sharp knife and then packed into large bags. All natives employed on the plantation are engaged under contract as indentured labor and they're paid wages according to set government standards. They're always very happy to work for the mission where good treatment is assured. bags are carried to a nearby drying shed where the moisture is removed by drying over a slow fire. The cured and dried coconut, called copra, is exported all over the world for use in food and soap manufacture. Profits from this enterprise have played a big part in rebuilding the mission, but little would have been achieved without the enormous personal effort of the missionaries themselves. Before the war, the mission had a well-equipped printing shop and published catechisms, prayer books, school books and newspapers in many languages. But with the arrival of the Japanese, all the printing machinery was confiscated and many books were destroyed. Here again a fresh start has been made with new equipment to replace the old. As elsewhere, a trained brother is in charge and his helpers are both coloured and native. Books are being published in 32 native languages, as well as in Pidgin English. For some work, handsetting of type is still a necessity, but where possible, type is set by teletype, which speeds up the process considerably. Two newspapers are published, Catholic News in Pidgin and Talaigu, meaning my friend in the Gunantuna language. Their circulation is over 5,000. Modern machinery is employed not only for the printing, but also for the folding. Besides printing for themselves, the mission undertakes printing for government departments and even for business firms and private individuals. The completed article is always neatly finished, with a cover calculated to appeal to the native eye. The climate plays havoc with book binding, and old books, not easily replaced, are sent to the printing shop where native boys do expert repairs. Even altar charts for mass are set up and printed on the premises. And no apologies are needed for the standard of workmanship. But faith, as St Paul says, is from hearing. Neither buildings, nor machines, nor books of themselves were conversion. It's manpower that counts. And with only 61 priests for the vast area, Bishop and priest rely on more than 500 native catechists to help to spread the word of God. 
catechists are trained at central schools and are directed, advised and encouraged by the priest in charge of their district. The war seriously interrupted the work of catechist training, but nowadays it's fully re-established. At Kinigunan, near Vunapopia, a course of short-term training has been organised for older boys, and it's already showing good results in making up the losses caused by the war. Young men from every section of the vicariate are studying hard to qualify as catechists at this training school. Their future work will be to teach school children in both secular and religious subjects, to instruct older people, to prepare the church for mass, and to lead the people in prayer when there is no mass. The catechist school is famous for its well-trained brass band. Competition is very keen for a place in its ranks. go to the junior and senior teacher training colleges at Vuvu near Rabaul, where a crucifix carved by a native marks the entrance. St Mary's, the junior college, is conducted by Australian Christian brothers, while the Irish Sacred Heart Fathers have St Paul's, the senior college. Although these colleges are junior and senior, there's not so much difference in age as in scholastic attainments, so there's keen rivalry in sport especially on the football field. Soccer is the brand of football favoured and bare feet are the order of the day. But that makes little difference to these lads whose feet are toughened by years of hard wear. The game is skillfully and vigorously played in spite of the humid climate. At least seven years training is required to bring the trainee teachers to full government standard. For girls, there's a central school at Vunapopia, with about a hundred of them between the ages of 13 and 20, selected from all the girls in the 389 elementary schools, are studying under the Sisters of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart. The students are a picture of neatness and efficiency in smart, colourful uniforms and are justifiably proud of being pupils at this school. The course of studies comprises all the ordinary school subjects as well as religious knowledge, domestic science, arts and crafts. The sisters find the girls eager for knowledge and quick to learn, intensely interested in other countries far across the sea. Many will eventually marry catechists and teachers. Some will become teachers themselves. Some will train as nurses, while others will doubtlessly find their vocation in life as native sisters. But all will help to improve the status of women amongst their people and raise the standards of living and knowledge in every village. girls speak so many different languages and dialects, teaching is done in pidgin in the beginning. Gradually English is introduced and eventually all teaching is conducted in that language. Under the patient supervision of the sisters, the girls learn sewing and dressmaking and though their fingers seem awkward at first, they quickly acquire the necessary skill and make clothes for themselves and for others for whom the mission has to provide. Hand sewing and fine embroidery are not beyond their capabilities. As witness these colourful distinctive badges for the uniform of the boys of St Mary's and St Paul's Vuvu.
native arts and crafts are encouraged and often improved under the sisters' tuition. Materials such as banana fibre are readily available and they can be used to make useful and decorative articles. The fibre is stripped, dried in the sun. Then it's rolled into thread and woven into mat bags and belts with intricate designs of contrasting colours. Different districts have distinctive patterns and dyes and there's keen rivalry to produce the most attractive articles. Such pride in workmanship is encouraged so that they'll have the experience and confidence necessary to teach and demonstrate new methods when they return to their own villages. time for sport as well as schoolwork and the girls revel not only in their own native games but also in those taught them by the missionaries. Softball is first favourite and naturally the girls who come from missions and the care of American missionaries have a distinctive advantage over the others. The girls help to support themselves by cultivating gardens on the mission property like to cook some of their food in the traditional native way. Take a large taro, peel it, cut it into thin slices, husk a coconut, shred the kernel into a cloth, squeeze the juice of the shredded coconut over the sliced taro for flavouring, and then wrap up in several large banana leaves. Heat large cooking stones on the fire, make room for the packages of prepared taro, place the hot stones and cover with a thick pad of banana leaves. And after two or three hours, the taro is done to a turn and eaten with relish. From the pupils of the girls' school come many of the candidates for the native sisterhood, which has been established for many years. It has over 30 members and 15 novices and postulants. The native sisters were heroically faithful to their promises during the trying war years, in spite of severe hardships, and they helped the bishop and his missionaries to survive their trying experiences. Each receives advanced training in nursing and teaching. Their knowledge of native mentality gives them a distinctive advantage in both fields, and their work has really been most successful. The native sisters have been entrusted with the task of making all the altar breads for Mass and Holy Communion throughout the Vicariate. No small order when it's realized that 61 priests are saying Mass daily and over a million Holy Communions are received every year. The Native Sisters organize prayers and devotions for women and girls. They care for the mothers and babies, assist with nursing in the hospitals and in the clinic aid posts. Their reputation is such that there's a constant stream of postulants and novices eager to test their vocation and to prepare for the religious life.
There's a special school at Bunapopia, staffed by American Sisters of the Sacred Heart, for European and Chinese children and for children of mixed race. The children of mixed race are most unfortunate because their part European origin gives them superior abilities and a different outlook from the native people. And yet they're not fully accepted by Europeans. The course of studies in the school is designed to prepare them for clerical and technical work. The mission brothers will train some for employment in the mission workshops. Others will learn typing, shorthand, and bookkeeping and will be keenly sought after by private business firms and government officers. In this way, full use is made of their capabilities and the livelihood is assured. there's a separate school for the large Catholic Chinese population. The boys are in the charge of Chinese and Australian Maoist brothers, while Australian sisters of Our Lady of the Sacred Heart teach the girls. The Chinese people, unlike many Europeans, have come to New Britain to settle permanently. Their family life is strong and their children, always neatly dressed and alert, face life with confidence and will certainly grow into good citizens. The tiny ones in kindergarten are most appealing as they earnestly tackle the serious business of learning to count or to write in Chinese characters. They are all so solemn about nursery rhymes such as Little Miss Muffet. But their serious little faces break into smiles for games like Ring the Rosie. While the boys play soccer with an energy and skill that shows promise of making them top class footballers before many years have passed. Another important feature of mission work is the care of the sick. There are 24 hospitals in the vicariate with a total of 984 beds. Two of the hospitals have a treatment of leprosy. They have 248 patients. In the large hospital at Bunapopia, there's a big maternity section where more than a thousand are born each year. Here, young native girls receive a thorough training in midwifery and in child welfare work. Many of them return to their villages and are of invaluable service to mothers at childbirth and supervise the health and progress of growing babies. Two doctors are employed full time by the mission and never lack patients now, although there was a time when the natives were suspicious and frightened of medical treatment. The gardens surrounding the hospital are always crowded with children. When a patient comes to hospital for lengthy treatment or to await the new baby's arrival, the whole family comes too. Besides the regular hospitals, there are 24 clinic aid posts in remote areas where minor ailments are treated and injections given on doctor's directions. In addition, every missionary has to be something of a doctor in his or her own right, giving emergency treatment in cases of accident or sudden illness. Nearly half a million treatments are given in this way every year.
This care for the health of the people is already showing results, especially in raising the birth rate and lessening infant mortality. Little wonder then that more than 3,000 baptisms were registered in the vicariate last year. The Unipovic Cathedral was the scene for a big proportion of baptisms of both native and coloured people. Receive this burning light, says the priest. Keep your baptism without blame. During the Japanese occupation, a native catechist was murdered because he opposed their plans to take the wife of a Catholic native for one of their work boys. Each year, on the anniversary of his death, people from far and wide assemble in his village to assist at mass celebrated by the bishop. After Mass, a procession is formed to go to his grave in the nearby cemetery. Men, women and children, much impressed that the life and death of one of their own people should be so remembered, recite the rosary as the long procession wends its way through the village down the slope to the cemetery. At the grave, especially ornamented for the occasion, the parish priest delivers a moving address to the assembled crowd, praising the courage and constancy of the martyr in face of threats of torture and death, and urging the people to model their lives on his valiant example. No qualifications are needed when saying that the people of these islands make first-class Catholics. On Sundays and holy days, and for that matter on weekdays too, crowds of men, women and children can be seen on their way to Mass, not only at Bunapopi, but in every centre where Mass is celebrated. At Pontifical High Mass at Bunapopi, the cathedral is packed to the doors. The singing is simply magnificent and the beauty of the ceremonies is enhanced by the confidence and precision of the native altar servers. The whole congregation join in singing the common of the mass, singing in as many as six parts. The reverence and devotion of the people can almost be felt for the faith has taken a strong hold on 70,000 people throughout the vicariate. What is true of Bunapopi is true also of the 55 large churches and 466 chapels that dot the islands throughout the vicariate. with success the labours of these heroic missionaries of the Sacred Heart who have come from Poland, Germany, Holland, America, Ireland and Australia to bring the light of faith to those that sit in darkness and the shadow of death. Yes, the Lord of the Harvest has set his seal on their labours. May he continue to bless their work and inspire many generous souls and tear for this vast mission field where the harvest is great but the laborers are few. <laughs>